Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful day. We appreciate you joining us. Today, as my guest, we have um, two individuals, and we're going to talk about um, investments outside of your normal bank deposits and also conflicts of interest and the fiduciary duties for board members related to that. Um, we have Nalan, who is with the law firm of Astor Kupchak. Ah, I got it wrong. of Jack Hastert. And we have David Levy, who is a retired CPA. Um, he is originally from San Francisco and was very active in um, in the accounting for condo communities. Um, and it's very vested and um, knowledgeable about the California laws, um, but most importantly about money. That's the important part, about money and how to make sure you don't lose it. Um, and you manage it correctly. So um, what I wanted to start off is because um, we, we get a lot of emails from um, board members asking questions about moving their money outside of the normal FDIC insured bank deposits. They want to move them into like mutual funds or um, what's one that I heard was I-bond or um, something else um, that would be um, some other um, I call them vehicles. So, um, and and then the other part of the question was the people that are that um, are approaching them or having the conversation with these board members are related to a board member. So it could be their existing broker that the board member uses, or it's like a relative of a board member that are soliciting these board members to do these um, investment opportunities because everybody wants the better bang for their buck, but sometimes it's not always the correct way when it comes to handling um, association money because you, you're, you have the fiduciary duty of maintaining it and not wasting it and you know doing bad decision making. So um, let's start off with, um, with not. Tell us about what the statute says and what they can and cannot do. Yes, uh, so uh, in Hawaii, the condominium statute in section 4, uh, 149, uh, I'm talking about chapter 514B, of course, uh, it talks about uh, how the association should handle and disperse its funds. Specifically, you know, of course, they require the funds in the general operating accounts of the association not be commingled with the funds uh, for other activities. Uh, for your reserve study funds, like the investment portion in subsection B, uh, uh, in subsection C, uh, basically it talks about, you know, uh, there are several options uh, and there's an or in between these options, meaning all these options are permissible under the statute. Uh, of course, deposit in a financial institution uh, um, located in Hawaii. Uh, whose deposits are insured by agency of the U.S. government, uh, or it could also be a trust company uh, authorized to do business in Hawaii, uh, or held by the U.S. Treasury, or purchased in the name, or held for the benefit of the association through a securities broker that has office in Hawaii, and also uh, the accounts, uh, you know, are insured by Securities Insurance Protection Corporation. Uh, it, of course, it also possible uh, for a, fa a federally insured financial institution in Hawaii for investment in CDs, um, federally insured as well. So, David, what's your take when, you know, when boards move their um, funds outside the traditional FDIC insured depository account? Okay. Um, well, I want to start off with a war story about an association that in that won a $7 million lawsuit and they didn't need all their money right away. And uh, unfortunately for this association, they had a board member who was a stockbroker and the stockbroker convinced the board they could get a better rate of return by investing in stocks and bonds. And unfortunately, this association was making good money for a little while until the market took a turn for the worse and they ended up losing $2 million. Um, generally, as not pointed out, you know, board members are fiduciaries and they need to protect the principal. It's not about how much money you make, it's about whether you lose any money. So most associations traditionally invest in certificates of deposit 
or treasury securities. Um, certificates of deposit, there's a limitation of $250,000 per institution, unless the institution is part of what used to be called the CDARS program, and now it's called intra-fi network deposits. So basically, if the association, let's say, had a million dollars and they only like dealing with one particular financial institution, if that institution is a member of this network, then it would it would take seven hundred fifty thousand in two hundred fifty thousand dollar chunks and and invest it in other banks that could be located anywhere within the United States, and that's okay as as I understand reading the Hawaii statutes, and that's pretty common because otherwise, if the association has several million dollars. Uh, but there's a $250,000 limit per institution, you'd, you'd have to open up bank accounts everywhere. So that's that's probably the most logical source of uh, investment for associations. Also, in today's world, it makes sense to ladder your CDs. In other words, stagger the maturity dates by six months or a year, especially at the moment since interest rates are rising. And that way, your money is protected and you're still earning a pretty good rate of return. For those that want to invest in, in any U.S. treasuries, the association can open up an account in the association's name, not an individual, uh, and op open a, a treasury direct account. And uh, we've had a lot of clients that have done that over the years. So um, one question that was posed to me, because um, some of the banks have their... Um, brokerage divisions, right? Where they do CDs and other kind of stuff like that. So are they still covered under FDIC if they put it into their brokerage divisions? Well, as a matter of fact, some of the, the big name brokerage houses, um, if, if you look carefully at their statements, um, some of them have banks. So um, like Merrill Lynch, okay? They, they may have a Merrill Lynch bank as well as your securities account. And if you read the statements very carefully, it will indicate how much money is in the bank accounts and, that, and how much is covered under the $250,000 FDIC limit. So yes, with some brokerage houses, you can have FDIC insurance, but for most securities, it's covered by SIPC insurance, Securities Investors Protection Corporation, that is not the same thing as FDIC insurance or um, or whatever the federal insurance is on credit unions. Okay. So, so now what would be um, the um, the legal um, requirement for a conflict of interest when when they're using um, a board member is introducing someone that they know to invest. The association funds and how does the board need to really react to their fiduciary duty about placing those funds into something else other than an FDIC insured depository? A conflict of, of interest transaction, you know, that refers to when the director of the association has both either like a direct or indirect interest. You know, in a situation, of course, if your relative works for that brokerage. Uh, under the statute, if you look at a 414D-150, not exactly fits into, fits into the, um, you know, the definition there, but still it's inappropriate. Like any bidding situation, I usually recommend my clients, you know, at least get three bids, compare. And if you have that affiliation, it's good practice for the board director to make disclosure and then try to recuse from voting on this specific issue. You can have the rest of the board fellow directors vote on it and they can have multiple, you know, beatings. Again, you know, you also got to compare with the commission amounts, you know, if some other better vendor offers a better deal, then, you know, you choose the best, you know, ultimately the guiding star still, you know, the standards of fiduciary duty as the director, you owe the fiduciary duty to the association 
what would a reasonable board director in similar circumstances would do? Did you put the association's interest, uh, you know, first? Uh, and did you act in good faith? Are you relying on good advice from your CPA or from licensed investment professional? Or you're just, you know, out of your own interest, try to make self-dealing or, you know, I mean, that that's all the, I mean, the other situation there. But, you know, of course, for association uh, reserve funds, as, you know, David mentioned, the primary purpose is to try to preserve the principle and also to maintain that liquidity accessibility when you need the money. I mean, even if it's a very safe uh, retirement, but if you're going to be locked in for 20 years, the association won't be able to access it. But when the need arises, that's not a good prudent investment. So really, uh, it depends on the circumstances and, you know, it goes all into the analysis. When in doubt, of course, the best advice for any board facing that situation is to seek consultation from your attorney, seek consultation from your CPA or your investment professional to really see, make the best decision for the association. Yeah, that's a good point, but not putting all your eggs into one basket. So don't move all your reserves into another fund that you're locked into for X amount of years, because some could be 10, 15 years before they come to maturity, right? So if you're um, if some emergency arises, but you're stuck because you have that one fund that you can't take the money out, or you suffer a big penalty if you take it out early, right? And some of those um yeah, one other one other point, if I might interrupt. I, I we can confirm this with NA. I think part of the statute I saw somewhere that if the maturity date's more than 10 years, then um, either the membership has to approve it or maybe the board has to do something more in terms of scrutiny about it. And That's correct. Uh, the statute basically says if the, the obligation you invested in has a maturity date longer than 10 years, then a majority vote of the unit owners will be required, you know, either at an annual meeting or special meeting or via written consent process. That's all required under well, Hawaii law. Great. Also, another another point in looking at the treasury securities or certificates of deposit, um, remember that if if you buy treasury securities, you you are not subject to state income tax on treasury security interest. So um, even though oftentimes the CD rate might be slightly higher than treasuries, it might be worth checking with your CPA to see if possibly the treasuries are a better deal than uh, than CDs because it's tax-free at the state level. Right, so yeah, so you would maximize the actual earning potential by looking at that, um, how it all plays out at the end, right, at the end of the day. Um, right. So we're, so, um, so if I was sitting on a board and we're, um, number one, whoever introduced this, this concept, we're using the word concept, and um, they were a board member. So they really, once they introduce, they kind of have to excuse themselves from any participation in the discussion of this particular item going forward, correct? Because they have to disclose in nature and they can't participate in the discussion. Of, if they're going to discussion was to move the funds into another vehicle, right? If, 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 are you saying if they have a, a, a conflict of interest? Right, so they have to disclose it, the nature of the conflict, and then they can't participate in the ongoing discussion of that particular topic. Am um, I understanding that correct? No? Hmm. Well, before, before we get the legal opinion, the non-legal opinion might be that it would be okay to be able to discuss, but they, I can't vote on what to do. I agree that that is, uh, yeah. So if there is a conflict, then definitely make disclosure and then you cannot vote on it. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it, you're still, you're still entitled to information as a director. It, that, that, that's no problem. You know, if uh, you are not, you're still in the meeting, they're not like held in a special executive session, including that person, that should be fine. Yeah. Another thing for people to consider with perhaps with brokers or, or any financial institution is, what, what is their fee? In other words, just because you, you buy a, a treasury security of a given rate, um, I know this personally for buying some treasury securities, the, the, the financial institution gets a small cut also. So, you know, it's, 
you know, what, what's your bottom line that you're getting with a given investment, whether it's a treasury, a certificate deposit or anything else. So what's your actual earnings minus expenses? Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks good on paper, but then when you get to the bottom line, it's like, oh, well, it equals to a CD, you know? Um, <clears throat> so when they're discussing this item in a board meeting, can this item be done in executive session? You're talking about the, the 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 decision to invest in a certain um well ultimately all official decisions of the board needs to be reflecting the board meeting. Uh I mean, but if you know, for example, you're interviewing certain contractor or vendor, uh, you're just still doing that due diligence portion, try to compare deals, I think it's okay to do it via executive session. But ultimately, when the board is ready to vote. Uh, that process needs to be recorded in the official board meeting minutes. It cannot be just in the executive session, no. I just want to make sure because some people are using executive session to kind of um, uh, move away from um, the transparency of everything. So that was one question that came up in the email discussion that explained that. I could interject another comment about executive session minutes. In my many years of practice as a CPA, I've noticed that some associations do not keep the executive session minutes separate from the regular board meeting minutes, which seems to kind of get away from what the whole point of having executive session minutes is. Right. Um, anyway, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> Yeah, so executive session should be used only for situations where you need to preserve certain confidential information like attorney-client privilege information, sensitive personnel issues, or like, you know, when you deal with a certain vendor, try to compare pricing that treat sort of treat secret kind of sensitive information they don't want the public to have access to. Those are, you know, or, you know, like you have a, a fair debt issues, you're trying to sort out a dispute with a certain owner who has a grievance of certain claim, then you use that process to deal with it. But it's not a place where you conduct official association business. Okay. All right. So any other tidbits that you want to, um, to um, let our board members know on this particular topic? Like, you know, um, David, if you can reiterate um, about the safe way of keeping your money safe um, and the, uh, the legal issues if you move your money outside of the safe or, you know, your typical safe environment. Um, what's the ramifications that can happen to the board? Well, I mean, um, to bring up a, a subject we talked about before this session, uh, let's, let's say that uh, the association wants to invest in bonds of either the state of Hawaii or the federal government, because maybe the bond rate is a little bit higher than CDs or, uh, or treasury notes or bills or something. The, the thing about bonds, my personal preference is if you're going to buy bonds, buy the individual bond so that if it declines in value, as long as you hold it to maturity, you won't lose any money. But if you buy a bond fund, even though perhaps it's okay under Hawaii statute, uh, you could lose principal if when you have to sell it or get out of the fund, the value happens to be down. So, you know, once again, I would repeat, you know, the idea is to, to preserve the principal. That's your, your fiduciary duty. And uh, that's that's exactly what you should be doing. Sorry about that. Um, I no, no issues. Yeah. Oh, sorry, David. No. Yes. I, I, sorry. Yep. No. Okay, so uh, of course the statute says any person who embezzles or knowingly misapplies association funds received by ma the managing agent or the association is guilty of a class C felony. Uh, in reality, if a board you know breaches their fiduciary duty on reserve study investment and you know 
in general handling of the reserve study, then you know you are exposed to uh, claims, lawsuits, even personal liability. I want to point out, you know, as far as the, you know, you got to also make disclosures. The law requires you in the Hawaii administrative rules. There's a specific provision talking about, you know, if your reserve is underfunded or there are cer certain even components of your common elements that are exempted in the reserve study, you ought to disclose that clearly in your, you know, budget or reserve study information disclosed to all the unit owners. And if you are not behaving well, the association members has a right to sue you, a director. They can even, you know, in that situation, not hold the association responsible for these lawsuits they incurred in pursuing this kind of claim. They can directly go after directors to collect that kind of expenses they, in, util, they incurred to try to protect the association's overall interest. That is in section 16-107-75 uh, of the Hawaii Administrative Rule. So really just, you know, fiduciary duty should never be taken lightly uh, in this kind of situation. I think, uh, as David mentioned, it, it's always better to, you know, act prudently, even err on the safe side, you know, as, as a fiduciary. So the takeaways is really ultimately, if you invest money, don't do it to the point where you're going to lose your principal. Even after you subtract out your costs. You really don't want your principal to be paying any fees or costs or charges to get out of it early. You want to preserve that your principal amount, whatever money you put in. Um, you know, you may have gained and you may have lost, but you're not taking away from your original investment. And um, making sure you do your due diligence, um, apply the business judgment rule. Um, do your um, if you're related to the person that's doing the presentation or whether the, the where the items go. The money's going to go to make sure you properly disclose your conflict of interest um, and um, conflict of interest, business judgment rule, and fiduciary duty to the association. Right? That seems to cover them all. Great. Okay. So when you get to this junction, you guys, I mean, every, every board member needs to understand that they should also make sure that they seek the advice of their legal counsel when it comes to something like this. This is really, to me, very sensitive. Um, and it could ultimately cost the association an unimaginable amount of money in the end um, if it goes sideways or goes south, right? So you right. want to always make sure you have the, um, I want to say the blessing of your legal counsel. Um, and I'm sure they will put in some precautions as well um, of what not to do or don't do this or, you know, to make sure that the board is covered and um, they're properly disclosing this information to their owner's of um, what they're um, planning to do with the association funds. Um, so any other closing comments that any of you want to make? Yes, never buy stocks in the stock market as a homeowners <laughs> association. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think we're nearing our end. So um, I really want to thank both of you for participating in today's um, segment of Condo Insider regarding um, where to put our reserve money funds and how to not lose them. And then also making sure that we all comply with our conflict of interest, business judgment rule and fiduciary duty as board members um, that we need to really comply so that we don't um, get into a legal situation that's gonna really take that money away in legal fees to protect the association, right? So thank you. And I hope you guys all have a good weekend. And hope to see you soon. Thank you, Na. Thank you, David. Thank Thanks you, really. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. You too. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter.
and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.